Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Ressa. For today's Rappler Talk, we have you know a dear friend who has been a, a top anchor. He's been a, a businessman uh, and also a presidential spokesman at one point, right? Somebody working for government. Uh, Ricky Carandang. Ricky, it is so good to see you again. Nice to see you too, Maria. I hope we're all staying safe indoors and uh, staying uh, virus free. <laughs> so, of course, the question, you know, the last time ABS-CBN went dark was in 1972, and it was followed by a 21-year dictatorship. That moment when it went, when it shut down, what went through your head? I wasn't entirely surprised. I mean, given the signaling of this administration since they came into office, specifically with regard to ABS-CBN, um, they had indicated uh, anger towards ABS-CBN. The president has at times explicitly said that they would not renew the franchise. The thing is, though, the president and the administration has been all over the map on this. There are statements of him saying he doesn't want ABS-CBN's franchise renewed. There are statements of him saying, you know, things are things are okay. You can you can proceed. So so I'm not entirely surprised given the signaling. But I what what I think gets lost in the analysis is is the fact that the administration has been all over the map on this. They have been they have been openly hostile. They've been conciliatory. So either way, I don't think I would have been entirely surprised. What does this mean? Well, a lot of people have already weighed in, and I think I would agree with the consensus. I mean that. The ABS-CBN, um, along with Rappler, along with the Inquirer, for all their faults, they do serve as a check and balance. This country historically has not had strong institutions. So as a democracy with not very strong institutions, that, that uh, you, you need people in the media to provide that check and balance. I mean, we know that... that, uh, that our constitution, our political culture has led to a very powerful executive. And they get their way with, with most of the branches of the government. And it's really only a few select media that have managed to, to hold the line, as it were. You know, I mean, media traditionally has been the one, the last line of check and balance. And um, I, think, I think that's the problem when, when they go after the Inquirer, uh, Rappler, and ABS-CBN that they're weakening that independent sort of check and balance uh, mechanism that, that uh, open society should have. So, of course, you know, Rappler has called this a battle for press freedom, and I have said this is a death knell. I guess in terms of, in terms of your, your view, you've been a, a palace spokesman, right? I mean, not, you've worked for a president. Uh, you just talked about the checks and balance. We've had massive disagreements in the past, and you know, President Aquino's administration didn't like Rappler at different times. Why did you tolerate it? Well, um, whatever you say about President Aquino and his administration, they always believed in the rule of law, and they always believed that. I mean, these are people who have who have uh, sacrificed for democracy. They, they have a model of democracy, they're committed to it. It never would have occurred to them to take the kind of actions that this administration is taking. Absolutely, we have had issues with the media. We have contemplated legal action against specific media outlets, but those were all in the context of allowing them to operate and perhaps holding them accountable in the same way that they try to hold government accountable. It did not go beyond uh, what is perceived as norms. It didn't go beyond the law. It didn't go beyond anything that would damage uh, democracy. We get to this place because right now it is debated as a rule of law, as a law, as a legal problem, right? Of course, you know, I have very strong opinion since we've come under attack also legally. How did it get here, Ricky? How did ABS CBN to... shut down. How did it get to this point that 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 we're even debating this is uh, uh, an act that is okay? Well, let's let's not forget that President Duterte remains immensely popular with the Filipino people. In his fourth year in office, President Duterte retains political capital like no other president before him has, and so. He's not become a, a lame duck. He remains very powerful. He remains very influential. And, and um, he's doing what he can, I think, to, to, uh, to retain that, that influence. 
Talk to me about the context that this shutdown of ABS-CBN happened during a time of a pandemic. Well, it's perfect timing politically. I mean, think about it. We're all distracted by a huge global, once in a century, life-threatening event. And we're all taking turns to deal with that. I mean, doing our best to deal with it. It's the perfect time to pull a fast one. <laughs> Interesting. Does rule of law still exist? Rule of law is hanging on by a thread. The fact that you're out of jail and that you've done that largely through recourse to our legal system uh, suggests to me that there's hope for rule of law. I mean, it's being weakened, I think. And ABS-CBN rightly, I think, has taken its case to court and left it with the Supreme Court. For all the faults of the judicial system, and again, there are many, there does seem to be a genuine effort among many legal practitioners to retain the rule of law. Um, so, so it is under assault, but I don't think that it is as close to crumbling as sometimes we might think. There are still people in judiciary who are able to practice independence. Uh, what is the impact? This, we're in week eight, the end of week eight of a lockdown in Manila, right? And we're, there is now talk of extending it in, uh, even more. And I'm going to shift you slightly to economics. You see a lot of things. You think about this a lot. What is the impact in the medium and long term of where we are today? Well, you listen to analysts who study it much more closely than I do, and they are looking at a global recession. Europe is expected, Europe's collective GDP this year is expected to shrink by almost 7%. Uh, the United States is clearly, I mean, even the economists will tell you, they are already in recession. Uh, I think that, that the Philippines is probably as close to reaching a recession as they have been uh, at any time. Remember, we have been a very resilient economy, have not actually fallen into a technical recession in, if I'm not mistaken, almost 20 years. And um, now, I think early indicators suggest that the economy is actually going to shrink by a larger degree than what uh, is officially being estimated. We've already had the first quarter of uh, contraction, right? Uh, and yeah. then we're seeing numbers coming out that show great unemployment. Uh, you know, again, having worked in government, is there a, are there things we should be doing that aren't being done yet? I think in terms of plans, in terms of... Uh, dealing with the economic aspects of this pandemic. I think the plans are there. Um, the real question has always been, whether it's our administration or this administration, is in execution, right? So you have a conditional cash transfer program. You have a database of that. They've been trying to pump more money into that. They've been pumping more money into the LGUs. But I guess the problem has always been in the execution. So you can download, the DBM can download the billions of pesos, and it can end up in the coffers of the city governments and then that gets downloaded down to the barangays. But on the ground, you hear people on the ground saying, you know, we were supposed to get this from our barangay. It happened in the first week, maybe the second week, but now where is it? It's gone. So, so uh, in terms of planning, I don't have much to say. I think it's really been an execution. And when you're in government, it's always been about execution because there are a lot of brilliant people in the country, and many of them are working for this administration, the previous administration, and the administration before that. It's not a question of planning. It's really a question of execution, and that's where we always fall short. Can I ask you, you know, the way the government, in many countries around the world, the way the government handles this will will determine politics, right? There are three main things that they're balancing, the, the state of our public health uh, 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 our facilities and and uh, what we are capable of handling, uh, the the quality of crisis management, and then that last one is how to create. Singapore calls it social cohesion, but trust. Uh, what's the impact on politics of what is happening? I mean, uh, again, shutting down ABS-CBN, allowing a franchise to lapse, and then shutting it down. That's unbelievable at any other time. And it is only 34 years after uh, the People Power Revolt. Yeah, and, What's and the impact on politics? After, uh, after Marcos shut down ABS-CBN again, uh, so, so this is the second time since martial law that, that ABS-CBN has been shut down by a president. Yes, 
So where do you see this headed? I mean, you said that the president is popular, President Duterte is popular. And yet, when we look at, and Rappler has done this story, when we look at social media, we also see Filipinos engage now in ways they have never been. Uh, on April 1, after President Duterte said, shoot them dead, referring to, to the violators of quarantine. Uh, there was a oust, hashtag oust Duterte now trended. Uh, and then the shutdown of ABS was double that number, double that, you know, that number one. That would have been unthinkable also before then. What yeah. is the impact on politics in our country of, of these, these collective uh, events? It's hard to say at this point, Maria, because what's happening now is it's kind of like a high-stakes poker game. President Duterte admittedly remains popular. This COVID situation has not diminished his popularity. In fact, the public generally supports what the administration has been trying to do and does not fault them for the shortcomings in execution. So he remains popular. Now, his bet is that can they shut down uh, ABS-CBN and, with, and um, withstand the political fallout. Because what you have to understand also is that over the decades that ABS-CBN has existed, it has built its own nationwide constituency. It has created a brand that is so strong and so resonant in the minds of Filipinos, Capamilia, that it has its own political capital. And so at the end of the day, ABS-CBN is going to do what it can to get itself opened up. And it's going to use its political capital to get itself opened up. At the same time, the administration and whoever else is behind this is going to use what political capital they have to keep it shut down. So it's become a high stakes poker game. It's a zero sum game. Either they're shut down or they reopen. Someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. Ah, a pivotal moment. It's a pivotal moment. You know, I've, I've often talked about the last four years as death by a thousand cuts of our democracy. And I guess... I worry, right? Like, obviously, <laughs> I worry about going to jail. I worry about, I worry. What do Filipinos care about right now? Filipinos, I think ordinary Filipino has, Filipinos have always cared about one thing, and that is to put food on the plate, to have a decent, dignified uh, means of livelihood, and to provide for their families. And it's always said that as long as people are struggling to meet those basics, they won't care too much about other issues like China's increasing encroachment and violation of our sovereignty, the, the, uh, the extrajudicial killings. People will care about that. But number one, uh, and I, I guess there's some truth to it, people are very busy trying to fend for themselves. And so they'll care about it, but will they care about it to actually do anything? Maybe, maybe not. Secondly, I think you have to give President Duterte credit for understanding the psyche of the Filipino and the voter in such a way that he has commanded an almost cult-like reverence by many Filipinos for him. And so he has that political capital, and I think that, that, that he's not afraid to use it. So, so um, yeah, um, it, it's, it's kind of an interesting time. Uh. Where's the business community stand in all of this? Uh, uh, week eight going into May 15th, right? That's this lockdown will have a, an impact on everyone's businesses. Yeah, businesses are hurting. And uh, especially those involved in retail, leisure, uh, transportation, mass transportation, those businesses are hurting. And I don't know how many of them can survive a prolonged lockdown. The, the trick has always been to try to find the balance between um, saving lives and, and um, getting the economy going again. And so I've been, I've been in touch with, you and I discussed this a couple of weeks back. I've been in touch with people who work in emergency rooms and all that. The, the, the curve, the whole thing about ECQ was meant to flatten the curve. We're getting there. We're not there yet based on what I'm reading we're, we're beginning to plateau, but ideally, we would probably have to ECQ until maybe late May or maybe early June. And that's when, from a public health perspective, that's probably the ideal time. But you need to balance that with the economic destruction that's happening. And I think what the administration did by saying it's going to lift the ECQ by, by May 15th 
is it, it has sought to find some kind of balance between the economic priorities and the public health priorities. Um, so if you're purely looking at it from a public health point of view, it's probably too early. If you're looking at it from a purely economic point of view, it's way too late. And I think they've tried to find a, a, a balance here. What my friends in the medical community are saying is that because of that, you're probably going to see another bit of a spike in the number of cases towards the end of May and early June. But in the last two weeks, uh, sorry, the last two months, many hospitals that have been besieged by, by COVID patients have actually managed to ramp up their capacity. So I talked to someone in Makati Med and he said that since this COVID began, our capacity to deal with COVID patients has increased by six to seven times. So the hope is that if you are able to minimize, if, if the healthcare systems are able to deal with the inevitable increase, the spike that we're waiting to see in late May, early June, that it's not going to overwhelm the, the medical system and that they will be able to deal with the influx of cases. And that won't last too long because we have spent the last uh, two months in isolation. That's interesting, interesting. Uh, you're, I guess, you know, as we wrap up, I, I do believe this is a, a pivotal moment and a lot of what will happen next will be determined by how we react to these actions, right? Uh, your last thoughts, I mean, words of advice, what things should we be looking at? What things should we be doing? In terms of COVID or in terms of... The entire context, the shutdown of ABS-CBN, the, the ex potential extension of, of the martial law-like, I mean, you don't even have to call it martial law anymore, right? The conditions are in place. Uh, I guess, given all of these factors in place, what is your last thought, advice? This is what I think. Uh, and I was sort of getting to that uh, earlier, but President Duterte remains popular. And he, he I, I don't question that. And I do think that it is possible for ordinary people to continue to support and, and like this government and, and like this president, and at the same time, want to push back against an encroachment on, on checks and balances. It's not contradictory to say, I support President Duterte, but at the same time, I think I want ABS-CBN to be open. I think I want uh, Rappler to continue to, to uh, operate because it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not one or the other, right? I mean, a lot of people politically and online, the trolls and everything, have tried to paint this as, if you are for democracy, if you're for ABS, even a rapper, then you're against the therapy. I personally know people who are dismayed at the shutdown of abs cbn who are dismayed at the harassment of rapper, and who continue to say, but I don't get me wrong, Rick, I support President Duterte. So, so it's not, it's not, uh, don't let them divide you into an even or. It's, it's something that we need to do because that's the Filipino way of life to retain media for all its faults. Uh, you need to have a media there to, to speak truth to power. And, and you don't necessarily have to be anti-Duterte in order to take a position like that. So let's try not to combine the two because people will want us to combine the two, all of us, for, for political reasons. But we got to think about this for ourselves. You can support the president and you can continue to support a free media. And that's part of the give and take of, of democracy such as it is. So, so maybe my, my last thought is it's an issue of check and balance. It's an issue of media freedom. That's the issue here. It's not an issue of whether you're for or against the there. Not necessarily. Fantastic. Ricky Garadang, thank you so much for joining us.